space is open to us now. And our eagerness to share its meaning is not... Hello and welcome back to the Mead Making School whole series I'm doing. (laughs) We are in episode or class or whatever, 401, 401. So today's topics are even deeper than 301. Obviously, we've been through Mead Making 101, 201, 301. If you'd like to go back to the beginning and relearn those things, or if you haven't been through those, I highly recommend to hit those topics first. We're building on our blocks we've already done. Our foundation for Mead is getting stronger, but you got to start there. So I'm referencing some notes. You'll see them um, in a Google Drive link below. I have diligently tried to prepare these, so if you are someone who is visual and who just prefers to read notes, then check them out. I will be referencing pretty much everything on them. These do go pretty deep. I'm going to, of course, explain all the topics today, but if you're a visual person, check out these notes for all of that. So in R401, we're talking about a couple things today. Topic number one is back sweetening without stabilizing, which is something important to know about. Topic two is when to use high quality honey, as well as some honey sourcing. Topic three, organic nutrients versus inorganic nutrients and how to use them. Topic four, step feeding a brew and calculating some ABV within that, which can be kind of tough. And then finally, sulfites for aging, which is topic number five. Let's go ahead and dive into topic one, back sweetening without stabilizing. So I have kind of covered this in 301, but I wanna go deeper with it because I really want you to understand how to do it safely and how to do it well. Back sweetening is super helpful for mead making because it can help to, uh, of course, bring back honey flavor if that has been fermented out. Uh, continue to boost the fruit flavors, anything else that's going on there. Make a mead more pleasant in general, especially if you don't like dry stuff. So you can do this without having to stabilize. The topic I talked about in 301 was mostly the stabilizing or pasteurizing and then back sweetening. This is without doing so, without halting fermentation. So essentially at its core, it is the process of giving your yeast so much sugar that they can't eat it all. As simple as that. Now, let's let's unpack that, though, because you have to know a little bit about your yeast in order to do this. Every yeast on the market has some sort of cap, meaning that at the top end of its ABV range, it's going to slow down and stop. Most yeast brands will list that cap and say a range, like, you know, uh, it it has an alcohol by volume cap of 12 to 14 percent or 18 percent. Once you know what your alcohol by volume cap is for your yeast, you can start to calculate how much honey or other sugar you'll need to fully cap them out, to keep them from fermenting past or fermenting on all the sugars. If you have a really high ABV yeast, you're going to need a ton of sugar. Like an 18% yeast is going to need a ton of sugar. Important note here, as you are finding this cap, yeast are kind of finicky. If they're healthy and they're fermenting, they can actually push back, push past their ABV cap. So if it says 18 and then you're fermenting and it goes past that and it goes to 18.5 or 19, don't be surprised that your yeast are probably healthy and that's okay. So to make a sweet mead without stabilizing pasteurizing, you can either add more sugar than your yeast can handle over the course of time and or just at the beginning of fermentation, or you can use a non-fermentable sugar to back sweeten, and that's obviously not fermentable. So front loading your sugar up front, meaning let's say I'm making a 14% mead, and I want to have plenty of sugar at the end. I'm gonna pick a yeast that can go up to 14%, and then we're gonna go ahead and calculate how much honey we need. At that point, a 14% mead, I gotta do some rough math in my head, you're gonna need roughly three and a half to four pounds of honey per gallon of liquid. Or if you're using fruit, that's different. Essentially, you're gonna want to start your gravity at least 1.120 or higher with a 14% yeast. Obviously, we're talking about one specific ABV yeast. This, this is 
different per yeast. When you pitch all of that sugar in the beginning and your yeast start fermenting, they should hit their cap and leave some sugar at the end. One difficulty with front loading is that you need to ensure that your fermentation is still gonna be healthy. When you put so much honey or sugar into something like that, your yeast will ferment, they'll do their thing, but they'll also get a little stressed in the process. So giving them plenty of yeast nutrient and the right temperature range and all of those things will help them continue to ferment in a nice way. When I'm making super high alcohol meads like that, I am gonna often take and, and stagger my yeast nutrient or add it over the course of a couple days rather than add all of it at once. And this will help to feed them over time. The other way to do it with avoiding non-fermentable sugars is to step feed your brew. This means you're literally gonna take and add more honey over time. So let's say we wanna hit that 14%. You can add two pounds in the beginning, two pounds of honey in the beginning, let that start fermenting, add um, a half a pound a couple days later, add another half a pound, add another half a pound. Essentially what you're doing is just adding more sugar until those yeast hit their cap and you find your sweetness level that you desire. This is a great way to do it, but it is way more labor intensive. You have to be intentional. You have to add more sugar over time. You can't easily just add like, if you're gonna do this, you want to make sure that you are adding more honey on or, or whatever sugar on a regular basis. Don't wait until it ferments through all of the sugars there. The other way to do this is to back sweeten with a non-fermentable sugar. There's a ton on the market. I, I quite like quite a few of these. You'll see them on screen. Essentially what you do is you let your mead go as dry as you want it. Once it is fermented out, instead of having to add more honey, which would be fermentable, you're gonna add non-fermentable sugar to the sweetness level you want. Yeast can't eat this, and so they'll just leave it alone. So you'll have yourself a sweet mead based on the sweetness level you want without having to pasteurize or stabilize. So there is actually one more way I forgot to say. There's a way you can halt fermentation at the sweetness level that you desire without having to cap out yeast, without having to use non-fermentable sugar. This is the process of pasteurizing. So this is the only way you can do this. If you wanna halt an active brew, the only way to do it is to pasteurize. So you heat your liquid up. Essentially, let's say we started at 1.140 starting gravity and we reached 1.040. Our yeast are still able to consume sugar depending on whatever yeast you used. At that point, you're gonna take, you're gonna put all of those meads in bottles and or you could do this in a, a one gallon jug, but I don't recommend to do it. And then you're gonna heat that up in a sous vide you're gonna do it in a pot with hot water. To any of these temps, you wanna make sure that the, the liquid, the mead, gets to these temps. This will kill off the yeast, halting fermentation. Now, here's the thing. If you don't do this right, and you don't get the right temperature per bottle, those yeast will just kick back up. And so when you put your cap or corks on, they'll just kick back up, start fermenting, and those caps or bottles will explode. So you have to ensure to get the right temperature to kill off the yeast. This is a way to halt fermentation in its spot. I have a whole video on how to do that. I'll put it up somewhere. So that's how you make a sweet mead without pasteurizing and or stabilizing. All right, let's move on to topic number two, which is when to use high quality honey. Now I know a lot of you are already saying, well, of course I wanna use high quality honey all the time. And you should, here's the deal though. You don't need to use high quality honey in every instance. If you're making something that's a traditional mead, honey, water, yeast, you're featuring that honey as the main profile. Yes, use high quality honey. Find the best you can because that's the main highlight. If you're doing stuff that is heavily fruited, that is going to have other very predominantly strong flavors, don't worry about adding a bunch of high quality honey. And I know, again, this is a taboo. Some people are going to say, well, I should always use high quality honey. My apple cinnamon recipe features some honey character, which is important. Obviously, we're making mead, apple, and cinnamon. I'm mainly highlighting apple and cinnamon there, and that's what people really enjoy. I'm using pretty low quality honey. I use that pure and simple stuff from Walmart. It's about $3 a pound, I believe. Super cheap and that stuff works really well for what I'm doing. I'm saving money, I'm making more mead, I'm doing what I can with, with what I have. Same thing goes if you have a bunch of other crazy fruit meads. Mostly fruit, I would say, is where you can like fudge on the high quality honey. If I had tons of money 
and money was not an obstacle, I would always buy the highest quality honey and use it for every single brew. However, because this is a hobby, this is something we do at home, you gotta be realistic. You're not gonna be able to buy the $8 uh, a pound kind of honey and use that for all of your things. So don't be afraid to use lower quality honey on fruited or heavily other flavored meads and then keep your high, high, high quality stuff for the traditional meads or if you have some really special brew that you want to ensure has that character. Here's a list of a bunch of websites where I source my honey. I get a lot of great stuff in bulk, especially at my rate, I end up buying bulk honey, about 60 pounds um, or five gallons of honey, and that will help you go a long way, or helps me go a long way, at least. I mention all these things because I want you to continue to make mead and continue to be able to make mead. If you run out of money, obviously the mead stops flowing too, so just consider that. Let's move on to topic number three, which is inorganic versus organic nutrients in mead making. Well, 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 look who's here. Inspector Lestrade. Why, Mr. Lowe? So by this point, if you're this far in the mead series, you should know about yeast nutrition. Yeast nutrition is one of the most important things to make a good mead. And this is because at the end of the day, your yeast health directly impacts what that whole brew will taste like. I think the internet and other sources are slowly catching up and finding and seeing the science that has been done to figure out yeast and their health. So yeast need nutrient as they ferment along. The higher ABV, the more sugar content that is found in your beginning brew, the more yeast nutrient that is going to need to go into the brew. The lower ABV, less honey, the less nutrient you need. You can use a nutrient calculator. I'll put a link to one to tell you what exactly you need to add. But here's, here's the divide. I know a lot of people want to go fully organic with their mead making journey. So we have organic yeast nutrients, which I'll, I'll show you what those are, and quote, inorganic. However, they're still organic all in some form or fashion. Organic yeast nutrient is Fermade O. This is found in all the sources here are uh, found mostly with dead yeast. That's kind of what Fermade O is. It's a, a combo of dead yeast and lots of little micro and macronutrients that the yeast need to continue to ferment or to be healthy. So here's everything about Fermade O. Oh, I use it pretty exclusively. The other ones, the inorganic stuff is Fermade K, which is extremely similar to Fermade O, oh, but it includes one important element and that is dimonium phosphate or DAP. DAP is straight up nitrogen. And with all your organic nutrients found in Fermade K plus the DAP, you're getting a little bit of the best of both worlds. The other one is Dimonium phosphate itself, DAP. That is straight nitrogen. It doesn't have any micronutrients that those yeast need. So it's not like a balanced diet. Essentially what we're talking about is giving your yeast a balanced diet. The Fermade O, Fermade K have a balanced diet for them to eat and be healthy. Dimonium phosphate, not so much. There are other ones out there. People have kicked the ball around and said that raisins act as a nutrient. I've already done a bunch of testing on that. They do not act as a nutrient. Don't fight me about it. It's not true. There are some other sources, but generally speaking, you're going to find those three. There's stuff like Fermax, which is, I think, some weird hybrid of the two. When do you use each one? Well, if you want to do the full organic thing the whole time, just use Fermate O. Fermate O is fully organic. It has the nitrogen. It has the macronutrients, all the stuff you need. It has less nitrogen, though. That's something important there. If you don't care as much, the Fermate K is super helpful as well. It does include the dimonium phosphate. But here's the thing. Dimonium phosphate is the big kicker here. After 9% ABV, when your yeast are fermenting, They've started their, their process and they're fermenting. After 9% ABV, they can no longer metabolize or use dimonium phosphate. So if you use Fermade K or dimonium phosphate, it needs to be at the beginning of the fermentation. Specifically, it should be about 24 hours after the fermentation has started. Dimonium phosphate 
at the very beginning of fermentation can be kind of harmful to the yeast as they bud and they reproduce. It kind of hurts their cell walls and so it, it causes a little chaos. So let them go for 24 hours and then include your Fermid K or Dimonium Phosphate. That way they have time to build up their cell walls, their colony. The Fermade O doesn't have that problem. You just kind of pitch it in at the beginning or stagger the nutrition. But most importantly, after 9% ABV, do not include Dimonium Phosphate in your brew. You'll taste it, it will create some off flavors, it's not worth the struggle. Again, I will include a yeast nutrient calculator. I highly recommend you use it because it will help you know exactly how much to use. You, it will even tell you when to use them. So go ahead and check out that calculator. Both are great options, all three are great options. However, know when to use them. Let's move on to topic number four, which is step feeding a brew and all of the complications that come with that. All right, topic four, step feeding a brew. This is the process of adding honey over time. So rather than just throwing every bit of honey at the beginning and saying, all right, yeast, go for it, you're gonna help them ferment along. I kind of think of it like a marathon runner. And, and if they were gonna eat all of their food up front that they would eat normally during a run, then they're gonna probably not feel so great. But if they eat it over the course of their marathon, they're gonna continue to stay fueled. This goes for our yeast nutrient, obviously, and it also goes for our honey. So specifically, we're talking about step feeding honey to increase the ABV. Let's say we wanted to make a super high alcohol mead, 22%. This is achievable if you will add the honey over time. So let's pretend that we start with a brew that's two pounds or two and a half pounds of honey in the beginning. Our starting gravity would roughly be in the realm of 1.090. As that yeast starts to ferment, or starts to go along and it chews through some of that honey, we're gonna add a little bit more. So let's pretend 1.090, we let it start fermenting for a day or two, it gets down to 1.040. We're gonna add a pound of honey. Okay, so we add our pound of honey, mix it in, give it our yeast nutrient, and we let it keep going. Wait another day, okay, now let's add some more honey. Essentially, you're just increasing the honey amount over time until the point where the yeast have stopped. Now, I've done a whole video on a attempting to achieve a 25% mead, and I've been through this process. If you are diligent to give them yeast nutrient and your honey in the right way, it will go further than your yeast normally go, meaning that your alcohol by volume cap of let's say 18% for a yeast could be stretched to 18, 19, 20. It all depends on how healthy those yeast are in fermentation. So keeping them in the right temperature range and keeping them with the right nutrient amount of nutrient and all of those things. How do we calculate the ABV on these? It's not as simple as just saying, well, you know, I've, I've done a hundred and however many points of gravity and I throw it into this calculator. You have to do a little bit of extra stuff. Now it's not perfect. This math is not perfect to be honest. And I'm sure someone will refute that and say they could do it, but here's kind of what you do. All right, let me cut in real fast because I was just editing this video and I got bored even listening to myself go through all this math to figure out the dilution factor. So let me push you to meadtools.com. This is a website that my buddy Larry has designed. Specifically, there's not a dilution calculator, but there is one that works within the recipe builder. So you go in your recipe builder, you add all of your ingredients. For example, when you added your beginning honey, and then you added honey later. At the bottom of this little recipe thing, it will tell you the total del units, which is like a something we're not even talking about in this video, your ABV, your total volume, and all of those things. And it should factor in a little bit of that dilution. So that's a cheap way, quick way to do it. If you would like to do the true math, um, come talk to me. Let's figure out how to do it well, because I would love to, to figure out how to do it well, but I'm gonna use the Mead Tools route. You should too. But essentially, you're gonna go ahead and start plugging away your numbers. You have to look at how much uh, dilution has occurred and versus the ABVs, and that you know theoretical 25% brew that we made there might not actually be that, it might be less because of dilution. This also goes for your juices and things like that. Let's say you back sweeten with a bunch of some sort of juice, that's gonna dilute, dilute the brew, and that's some rough math to do. 
There are some calculators you can use to figure out dilution if you have the ability to do so, but here's the important thing. Step feeding your brew will help you have a healthier fermentation if you're trying to get a higher ABV brew in general. So just consider that if you're someone who wants to make a 25% mead, 20 something percent mead, add honey over time or step feed it. If you're someone who's making these big Polish meads, which I like myself, you have to step feed them because it increases the ABV and it helps give them a healthier fermentation. Overall, really fun to do, important topic. So that's, that's it, step feeding your mead. Let's talk about our final topic of this video. This is sulfites for long-term aging. If you're someone who wants to keep your mead around for a long time, you're gonna need to probably add some potassium metabisulfite. Sulfites are like historically renowned in the universe. Back in the Roman era, they actually found all of these pots and things that had specifically, I have to remember what it is, it was sulfur that was burned in the cask. So that was used to help age the mead better and preserve it over time. So even back then, they were doing stuff to try and preserve their meads. We have forms of Camden tablets, which are these little tablets that are basically potassium metabisulfite, and then the actual potassium metabisulfite powder. Camden tablets are generally a little bigger and they have a binding agent. So they're not all metabisulfite. They have some something there to help that. The metabisulfite powder is truly potassium metabisulfite. What you do to help your mead age, and really at any point when you're racking your mead into a new container, like you're wanting to avoid oxygen introduction. So let's say we made a plum mead, it's finished fermenting, we're moving it to a new container with an auto siphon and tubing. What I like to do is to take one candom tablet per, per five gallons and put that into the brew during the racking. All it does is it soaks up, gets rid of, and, or binds to all of the oxygen that's in there and gets rid of it, essentially. When you do this when racking, it just keeps oxygen out. Same thing goes for before you're bottling. Before you bottle, if you do some potassium metabisulfite, you put that into the big container, you're gonna draw out all the oxygen, all of those things, it'll help you out. Now, now don't do it per bottle. I'm not saying drop a Camden tablet per bottle, that's, that's psycho. I'm saying in your main batch of things, essentially you're just trying to draw out oxygen from possibly hurting your brew. I've done some testing of my meads Early on in my process, six years ago, when I or seven years ago when I started, I didn't use any sulfites. And I went through and tasted a lot of those meads and I noticed a funk. But then, when I started using the sulfites, I found a bottle of non-sulfited versus sulfited mead made in the same era, basically. My sulfited mead was much more enjoyable. It did not have any off flavors. It didn't have any funk that had developed over time because I think it was preserved better. Obviously, this is all up to you if you want to do this. Some people are sensitive to sulfites. I understand that. So just consider that, you know, however you want to do this. But I think at the end of the day, it is a super easy tool you can use to make your brews last longer. We want our brews to last years and years and years. There is an article that's part of this notes you can check out if you want to find out more information. So these are the topics for 401. I hope this has been helpful, maybe insightful, if you are trying to go deeper with your mead making. There is 501, so you can check out Mead Making 501 as well. My hope is that you take these notes, you take this knowledge, and you go apply it. That's the only way to learn about making better mead, is to literally go through the process of making things, making mistakes, and you'll find that through that, you'll make some better mead. It does take time and money. So. When you're bored, make more mead. Don't just sit there and watch your mead age because you'll just be super bored. Buy another carboy, buy some more honey, do something, make some more. And by the time you start doing all that, you'll forget about the one that you've got going and that will help you uh, be more patient in this process. Let me know what you think below about all these topics. I hope you'll check out the other episodes and thanks for watching. Cheers. Fashion.